Hey y'all, welcome back. So in today's show, we're going to break down the latest study finding that low vitamin D levels are much more common in subjects that have severe COVID-19 compared to subjects who just have mild or moderate disease. The title of the paper that we're going to unpack today is Pre-Infection 25-Hydroxy Vitamin D-3 Levels in Association with Severity of COVID-19 Illness. Now, it's important to understand that this study was conducted before the Omicron variant. We know that variant is actually much more mild, but I think it's really still important because so many governments and media pundits and health experts have been talking about how we need to do every little thing possible to improve the health of people and reduce the burden on the hospitals, but we haven't heard much about this very affordable uh, way to support whole body health, and that is by replenishing your body's vitamin D levels. Of course, we recommend going out in the sun, you know, getting vitamin D levels that way, but dietary supplements are very affordable as well. So let's dive into some of the nuances here, and then we'll talk about the details and the, the takeaways here. So more specifically, the authors say, 87% of patients that were admitted with severe disease have blood levels less than 20 nanograms per ml, which is the cut point for vitamin D insufficiency. In contrast, just 34% of patients with moderate illness had blood levels below 20 nanograms per ml. So what that translates into is patients with vitamin D deficiency, as defined as a blood level, as I just mentioned, below 20 nanograms per ml, were 14 times more likely to have severe or critical illness than patients with 25-hydroxy vitamin D levels above 40 nanograms per ml, which is really achievable in terms of if you're supplementing in the winter, if you live north of Atlanta, Georgia, we've talked about this multiple times on this podcast, even during the winter months between, well, really in the, to the fall, between October and March, uh, you know, even if you're getting sun exposure, you're getting outside during the middle part of the day, the zenith angle of the sun is insufficient. So you should be supplementing with vitamin D. You know, I, a lot of people ask about recommendations. Of course, uh, it would be, you need to work with your healthcare practitioner, do some lab testing. I will link some solutions there. Uh, but, you know, some of the folks that I've seen over the years between four and 6,000 international units per day seem to get those blood levels up into the 50 nanograms per ml range, which is where most of the magic sort of happens in terms of potentially improving vitamin D health and reducing some of these different diseases that we're going to talk about and dive into the details. So I want to get into the details, but friends, thank you for being here. Thank you for hitting that like button. If you're enjoying this content, you can always share this with a friend or family member directly as a text message that goes a long way. Your comments, your likes, your shares really help out our show. Also, if you're taking any supplements, you're taking iodine, you're taking probiotics, you're taking electrolytes, and you're just going to your big box store or Amazon, you can support our platform and help us with our research team and our writing team by going over to myoscience.com, checking out some of the solutions that we have for you. We are sourcing the most bioavailable ingredients in their best form when it comes to micronutrients and, and different solutions like that. So you can use the coupon code podcast over at myoscience.com. That's M-Y-O-X-C-I-E-N-C-E.com. Myoscience with an X.com. Use the coupon code podcast and I'll put links below. Let's continue on here. And I first just want to you know, sort of highlight something that I think is so interesting. And it's a recurring theme that I've noticed when I'm reading lay press reviews of articles like this, okay? And what I mean is Apple News did a little piece on this particular study from scientists in Israel that we're reviewing today. And they had to write this disclaimer multiple different ways, multiple times throughout the article. And that is to say that vitamin D alone does not supplant the need to get immunized and vaccination. So it seems that we're at this point when we talk about science and we talk about health that we always need to qualify. Well, this doesn't mean you don't need to go to get immunized. So if the solution or the remedy or the sort of preventative strategies that does not start with the letter V, we need to qualify that. As always, we need to say, well, you need to meet, meet with your doctor. You need to, of course, get your boosters and do all this. Like, it's, it's kind of crazy. And I think that's why from the scientific community, you know, a lot of these researchers are not getting funding to talk about things like vitamin D because it seems that the perception is that if you promote vitamin D, that there is, that is synonymous with creating vaccine hesitancy. I don't know why we're in this place. There's, we could do two things at once. We can walk and chew gum at the same time. If you want to get your, your shots, knock yourself out. If you also want to get vitamin D, cool. I mean, that should be the message. But uh, the, these articles keep saying, they want to make it very clear that what we're saying in this article is vitamin D supplementation is not a substitute for vaccination. It's crazy that we even have to qualify that. Uh, you know, Anyway, so 
Uh, we're in this weird place, but let's talk about the mechanisms. And then I want to share with you table three of this paper. Really interesting stuff. Okay, so what are the thoughts on the purported or proposed mechanisms by which vitamin D offers protective benefits in various studies, even before the COVID-19 outbreak? had shown that people that have sufficient levels of vitamin D3 in their blood, uh, they basically have a lower odds of developing and contracting various different respiratory viruses and influenza. So, so this has been long known. Uh, and part of this, particularly as it relates to COVID-19, because various meta-analyses and studies over the past two years have shown that vitamin D is protective from uh, getting severely ill or landing in the hospital. And the proposed mechanism uh, is several fold, but I think the biggest one here is how vitamin D and the vitamin D receptor can reduce two innate inflammatory signaling cytokines, interleukin-6 and TNF-alpha. And we know that one of the different sort of phenotypic characteristics within the immune system when differentiating people who just have a mild course of illness versus a severe illness is that cytokine storm. So it's this over-exuberant aspect of the innate immune system that creates collateral damage that can cause destruction of our own tissues, the kidneys, the lungs, the cardiovascular system, because these cytokines, as helpful as they can be when you're infected, if there's excessive amounts of, you know, if the innate immune system response is over-exuberant, then there is collateral damage. It's like bringing a sledgehammer to kill a mosquito. If you think about it, your innate immune system is going to cause, you're definitely going to kill the mosquito with a sledgehammer if you hit it, but you're also going to break a lot of stuff in the process. And it seems that that happens with people who get severely ill, even with potentially Omicron. So how does vitamin D weave into this narrative and, and this mechanistic aspect about reducing the odds of potentially getting severely ill? Well, it turns out that the vitamin D receptor, the VDR, reduces the innate immune system activation and lowers chronic inflammation. We've talked about these details. I want to just throw out a little bit of a, of, of a multi-syllabic word, but this is NF-kappa B, nuclear factor kappa beta. This is an upstream transcription factor that when triggered can stimulate your innate immune system and increase genes that make these pro-inflammatory interleukins and cytokines interleukin-6 and TNF-alpha. So if we can down-regulate the upstream production of these biomolecules that are an, a part of your innate immune system, then we can reduce the, the load. And so if you think about, let's just create an arbitrary analogy. If you have a glass and that glass is nearly full and you just add a few drops and it overfills, well, guess what happens? That could be the cytokine storm in the analogy. Well, if you reduce your glass to say 50% and you add some water to it, you're not going to be overfilled. So if we can sort of make that parallel with vitamin D, if we can bring down the pre-infection baseline of inflammation, then when we throw in some insults, whether it's a few cytokines due to the inflammatory process created by being infected, the thinking goes that perhaps we can reduce the odds of having such a cytokine storm, creating the collateral damage that is characterized by severe disease. So hopefully that makes sense. You might want to re-listen to that uh, if you like the biochemistry. If not, just keep watching and I'll share through some of the image images. Several things that I want to just highlight here. I have some notes. Uh, many doctors promoting masking and social distancing and the whole thing. I've noticed this is anecdotal, by the way. We're moving into the sort of bucket of opinion. This is my opinion. There's a lot of doctors that are promoting rampant sunscreen use. And so the supplementation aspect of this conversation is more applicable, particularly in individuals who wear big hats in the summer, who lather up in sunscreen, lather up their children with sunscreen and wear, you know, facial coverings and, and coverings on their skin to prevent the UVB and UV, uh, you know, skin damage. Okay. So if that's you, then you need to also consider supplementation. I know so many people who say, why well, go in the sun? Like these are clients that I've worked with. I don't know how I could be insufficient in vitamin D. Well, well, yeah, when you go in the sun, what do you do? Well, I wear SPF 50 and I have this big cap, this parka, and I do the, well, it's like, well, duh. I mean, yeah, you're, you're technically, you're in the sun, but you are preventing your skin from being exposed to the beneficial properties of the sun that are responsible for synthesizing vitamin D. So we need to consider that. We also need to, need to consider that this cutaneous synthesis is a little bit attenuated as you age. So if you're over the age of 65 and you work outside or you go outside, um, then you definitely want to supplement with vitamin D. Okay, so let's look at table three here. It tells the story 
quite well. I'm just going to sh uh, share this with you right now on the screen. Uh, very fascinating stuff here. If we look here at the pre-infection levels of vitamin D, and I want you to focus in on this table, uh, go over to the critical, which is right right here under um, right here under the COVID nineteen disease severity category. If you look at critical, and you look at the num the percentage of individuals that have insufficient vitamin D levels that also have critical illness when it comes to COVID nineteen. If you look here, ninety two point three percent of these individuals that have critical illness. Also, a commonality here, this doesn't show you the direction of causality, but the common future here, a characteristic, is insufficient levels of vitamin D. There's not a single individual who also has critical illness who has sufficient vitamin D levels. In contrast, when we go over here to just a mild diagnosis, and we look at individuals that have vitamin D levels above 40 nanograms per ml, 35% of individuals who have mild illness have vitamin D3 levels above 40. Now, if we if we combine individuals who have vitamin D levels above 20, 30, and 40 nanograms per ml, that is 92%, I'm sorry, that is 89%, I'm getting my numbers mixed up, 89% of patients with mild disease had non-insufficient blood levels, right? They had blood levels that I don't think are optimal, you know, 21 nanograms per ml is not necessarily optimal, but if we bucket those three different uh, sort of cohorts, uh, individuals again, between 20 and 29 nanograms per ml of vitamin D3, individuals between 30 and 39 nanograms per ml, and individuals with vitamin D3 levels above 40. So if we add all that up, 89% of patients with mild disease had sufficient levels of vitamin D. Only 8.8% .8 of patients with mild illness had insufficient levels of vitamin D, which is just interesting. Now, again, like I said, this really tells the values quite well. And all of these are statistically significant, a P of 001, which means you are in business, my friends. In statistics, that means that you could reproduce this data 999 times and still get the same result. That is how statistically significant this is. Now, let's just go over for fun. Go over, we already talked about critical illness. Let's talk about severe disease. And these are different uh, categorizations as characterized by the World Health Organization criteria for what comprises moderate versus severe versus critical illness. Let's look at severe. Okay, as you can see right here, 86.5% of patients that had severe disease also had a commonality, which is, guess what? They had insufficient vitamin D levels. Let's look at how many of the patients that had severe disease had blood levels above, let's just say 30. It's 9.4%. Okay, so what's a bigger number, 86% or 9.4%? Well, I know you know the answer to that. So this is a, a strong future. Now, again, we don't know the direction of causality. We don't know if the viral illness is causing, you know, serum changes in metabolites of vitamin D. But again, these are pre-infection levels. Uh, these were, uh, again, as you can see here, the materials and methods, uh, there was 1,176 1, patients who also had records before they got infected. This was at a particular hospital here in Israel. And 253 of these patients had records of a vitamin D3 level before they got infected, right? So this is not a perfect study by any stretch of the imagination, but it's an interesting correlation. And it begs the question that perhaps, and I, I, you know, a lot of us have been recognizing this for a long time, that perhaps vitamin D is influencing the immunologic response. It's a piece of the puzzle. It's not the only thing. It's, it certainly seems to be significant, uh, a strong correlation, and because the downside uh, of taking, there's really not much downside. There's not much cost to this. You can supplement with vitamin D, especially if you get liquid vitamin D. Small plug, you know, we, we offer that over our sister company, D3 Drops. Very affordable for the whole family. We're talking literally under probably five bucks a month to just maintain blood levels uh, that, that are in these and support vitamin D health. So a really affordable way to do this. And if you overdo the vitamin D, you really need to overdo it until you start to notice some of the unintended harms and hypercalcemia and elevated blood calcium. So a really easy way to support vitamin D health. All right, so I have a few more notes here and I just wanna to read to you a few things as we, as we continue on uh, and finish up this conversation. Okay, this is in the introduction of this, of this article. It might be kind of boring for you watching here, uh, but 
I think you'll enjoy some of this. So as with other respiratory infections, a link between vitamin D deficiency and COVID-19 is emerging. Low serum 25-hydroxy vitamin D levels among hospitalized COVID-19 patients have also been linked with increased disease severity, severity and poor critical outcomes. Uh, in addition, hospitalized COVID-19 patients have been shown to prevent lower mean and median levels of 25-hydroxy vitamin D than the general population and COVID-19 outpatients, which is important. So what, what they're saying is hospitalized individuals generally have lower vitamin D levels compared to people who are non-hospitalized in the general population, which I think is quite interesting. However, serum vitamin D is often measured uh, during hospitalization for COVID-19 which is important. We should be looking at this. Uh, when this is the case, determining the direction and temporality of the association between acute COVID-19 disease and low 25-hydroxy serum levels is a challenge. Meaning, in other words, uh, it is difficult to ascertain a definitive causative effect of baseline vitamin D status on clinical presentation during active COVID-19 infection. To better understand the temporal sequence between low vitamin D levels uh, and their association with severity of acute COVID-19 disease, we determined whether the severity of disease among patients admitted with acute COVID-19 correlated with their most recent pre-infection vitamin D serum levels. So they were, again, trying to just see, not look at testing while they're hospitalized, because as I mentioned earlier, vitamin D is involved in immunologic functions and there could be some, some acute serum changes. What these scientists sought to do is say, hey, let's just, I know it, it's imperfect, but maybe it's three or four months ago, six months ago for some people, you know, let's look at their vitamin D levels then and then correlate or track that with, you know, how, how they, how serious was the infection when they got infected? And so I think that honestly is almost even a little bit better. It would be interesting to for them to also look at uh, acute vitamin D levels uh, during the actual uh, hospitalization and also look at how the 125 dihydroxy vitamin D levels, because, you know, the we talk about this hydroxylation step, you know, the pre-vitamin D goes to your liver, then it gets hydroxylated, and then your kidneys hydroxylate it again, so it's 125 dihydroxy, so some people recommend testing both. I haven't found any sort of clinical utility involved in doing that, but some people you know, that are more advanced into the nuances and the subtleties of vitamin D metabolism might find that more helpful, but... All I suggest, my friends, is not overdoing the vitamin D. I, I know some people who run a blood level of like 90 nanograms per ml. That can be too high. You can certainly overdo anything in life, even vitamin D. I know that sounds crazy, but it, it is reality. So just test your blood levels uh, and see where you're at. And most of the data, as we've talked about on many other videos and podcasts over the last several years, shows and points to having a blood level around 50 to 60 nanograms per ml seems to offer uh, sort of the best ROI, if you will, in terms of cost, not getting the calcium levels elevated too much and getting some of the benefit there. So I think this is interesting. I just wanted to share this with you. I haven't seen other people really talk about this study yet. Um, I think it's cool. It's cool to know that pre-infection boost in vitamin D may... Of course, we can't talk about treating, diagnosing, curing, or preventing any disease here, and these statements have not been approved by the Food and Drug Administration, but it's important to understand uh, that there is a connection here between vitamin D and health, and I think we should consider that, especially because it's so accessible and affordable. And if we're serious about keeping the hospitals from being overfilled, especially during the winter season, you know, next year or so forth, we should remember these studies. So, as always, my friends, thank you for being here. Thank you for listening in iTunes. If you enjoyed this, you can leave us a little bit of feedback over in iTunes as a review. You can hit that like button, share this with a friend or family member, and we will catch you all on a future podcast down the road. Have an awesome rest of your day. Bye now. Yeah.